Sometimes, even in our greatest compendium of words, our most impactful and extraordinary literature, the text simply fades and we are left with a yawning space, a gap of seemingly insurmountable proportions, which asks us to either fill in the blank or to simply let it be. Such an instance occurs in this week's Parsha. Set the stage for just a moment. At the beginning of Parshat Pinchas, Pinchas, the grandson of Aaron, has turned back God's heat from the children of Israel when he committed an act of zealous vigilantism by spearing through the middle an Israelite prince and the daughter of a Midianite priest who were committing an act of unspeakable irreverence out in public in front of the tent of meeting. This is a painful, rupturous section, yet again. And God says to Moses, with an instruction to never leave the Midianites alone because of their behavior, they conspired against you in the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cosby, daughter of a leader of Midian, their sister who was slain on the day of the plague, in the matter of Peor. It's a bit of a garbled sentence, and then... It was after the plague. This plague, which had been introduced in the previous parsha, took down somewhere in the neighborhood of 24,000 Israelites, a sizable percentage of the population. And here, it was after the plague. And there is a space, not visible in the version we had on our screen, and that's all right, but I know it's probably hard to see, but in this art scroll version of the text, and in most Sifrei Torah, in the scribed versions of our story, there is simply a space, a void. And then the story picks up. And God spoke to Moses and Eleazar, son of Aaron, saying, take a census. This space that is there for us to behold in all of its vast emptiness is called by the commentators a piska be'emtsa pasuk, a pause in the middle of a sentence. The melody, the cantillation, suggests that more should come in that sentence, and yet it doesn't. There are just a very few instances in all of our Bible where we leave off in the middle of a sentence. Some are more obvious than others. Narratively, one of the most famous is Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. Cain said to Abel, and he rose up in the field and he killed his brother. Now, commentators had a field day imagining what it was that Cain said to Abel. But here, we're really just left with what Rabbi Sachs calls an audible silence. It was after the plague. The text skids to a halt, as if coming to the edge of a cliff, almost in a, a mildly comical or cartoonish way. It's very cinematic. The text stops and it's almost as though a few stones, small stones go hurtling over the edge of the cliff to land far, far below out of hearing's range. Rabbi Sachs describes this section as if the Torah were telling us there are times when even God is lost for words, when even heaven is silent because there was nothing to be said in the people's defense, with the sole exception of Pinchas's still rather questionable act of zeal. By the way, I'll just take this moment to recommend this extraordinary series of books by Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs called Covenant and Conversation. I was given the Genesis and Exodus editions, 
of this amazing series for my birthday last year by our dear friends, Diane and Paul Sattler. And these are extraordinary books. I cannot recommend them to you enough as all of Rabbi Sachs's works are extraordinary. These are Parsha by Parsha, between four and six essays on each Parsha. Each essay is enough to transform a life. When we look at this piska be'emtsa pasuk, this pause in the middle of a sentence, it is supposed to be a wake up. What is supposed to go in there? Is it a awkward transition from the story of Pinchas to the census? Or is it, as many commentators see, a bridge? That what went before and what comes after are intricately linked by this notion of the plague. We who live in this moment may in fact experience this audible silence in a very particular way. And I imagine that we do. And it was after the plague. Articles from even a few weeks ago suggesting how this coronavirus will end and what it will do to us seem already to have been written in ancient times. And in fact, the last few weeks have seen very few really credible predictions about life after this plague. It's as though we have realized collectively that because we are still so stunningly in the plague, that we've almost lost a taste for predicting what will come after it's over. Everything has been predicted from changes in the cruise industry and how we'll wash our hands and get together for summer barbecues to predictions of a total geopolitical and economic restructuring. So many predictions have been put forth, but the truth is that the prognosticators and the soothsayers and the fortune tellers can have a field day imagining how to fill in this gap, but it is an audible silence, one that demands our attention and our deep humility. We are likely, as our ancestors did, to do our best, to regroup, to recount, to note the losses, count what we still have, and stagger on. Rabbi Sachs offers that this is the way he sees Jewish history after the Holocaust, and it came to pass after the plague. There is nothing we can say. There is a reverberating silence, a black Whole that swallows speech. And then you count the survivors and begin history again. The pain is undiminished, the grief unhealed, history unredeemed. But there is no choice but to begin again, for that is what faith is. <laughs> after the plague. That is a story that is still to be written. Shabbat Shalom.